Okay, we're going to get back in our study on creation here. And uh, if you take your Bibles and open up to Genesis 1 1, we're going to talk a little bit today uh, about where was God before he created everything? Where is he from? And uh, I just thought we'd take a few minutes here and just investigate that for a few minutes. And that might help us understand how God can interact with creation and how God interacts with time and some of those issues. So um, why don't we start in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. We've talked about the importance of the word in. We've talked about the beginning and how whenever you want to investigate something, it's always good to go to the beginning, to where it starts, and how God was there at the beginning, and how he's the only one that can relate to us, what all happened at the beginning. And then we talked about God and, and who he is, and uh, who that God is in Genesis 1-1, and how that, that God there is, is Jesus Christ, and how he created all things, and we talked about the attributes of God and uh, the things that make up God, and how he's unchangeable, and how uh, we can count on him to be our rock and, and our stability, because we know he's not going to say something one day and then, and then uh, pull it back out of you. He, we can count on He does not lie to us. And when he tells us he loves us, and when he tells us the things that are good for our lives, we should be obedient and listen to those things. You see, we talked a little bit about how God wants to interact with his creation. He, he's made himself close to everybody. And we're going to talk more about it as, as we move forward to here. But something to remember is God wants an interpersonal relationship with everybody. Uh, you and I. And, and that part of that interpersonal relationship is the fact that God wants to tell you what's best for you. And that's why we have the Bible. is because the Bible is written to, to talk to you and to teach you what is right and wrong for your life. And that's a very important um, point to remember as we go through this li these lessons and as you just go through your Christian life, that the things we're going over and that the things of the scriptures are meant to change you and to cause you to, to, to become more godly and to cause you to live a life that's good. And God does that not because he... he he wants to keep you from uh, having fun. In it. It's because God wants you to have a joyful, peaceful, loving life. And he knows that brings true, true essence to life. Bring, it makes life meaningful. Uh, people think that they can live life without God. And by doing that, they can find peace and joy and love. And you can't. Uh, you live life apart from God, you, uh, you will find depression, you will find darkness, and we're going to talk about that darkness here uh, in another week or two when we get over to Genesis 1 where it says darkness is upon the face of the deep, how that's a, a life without God, and we're going, to, we're going to talk about that, how whenever you leave God, see God is light, anything outside of God is darkness, and you may think you can experience life apart from God and, and do life apart from God, but you know what you're going to find, you're going to find darkness. And wherever there's darkness, there's death. And uh, so we'll be going through, through some of those things as we move on. But in Genesis 1-1, for today's message, and today's, uh, <coughs> what we're going to go through is, in the beginning, God created. We see God there. We see God. He shows up before he created. He's existing before, I think there's an E, creation. You see how that works? And so the question is, where was he? Where does he come from? Because there, there's, a, there's a big uh, debate within philosophy and, and people who like to talk about the world. I was in a, a philosophy class once, and they, they were discussing is why is there evil within creation? And we'll talk about some of those issues in a, in a future message here. But the point was is that, <clears throat> is God within his creation or is he without his creation? And there's a, a, there's a prevailing thought that there's this creation and that God is a part of it. He's within creation. He's, he's uh, limited within. Creation binds God and in creation is, is, is essentially, essentially, essentially a, a large uh, house that God lives within, and he can't get out of it, because the house is the outer parameters, and there's nothing beyond that. And so there's a large segment of philosophy 
and philosophers and philosophers who believe that God is just, he's a creature within the bounds of creation. Okay? And then there's the way the scripture presents God, and we're going to see that, how we see here in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created. Well, to create the universe means you have to start from a place that's what? Outside the universe. Okay? In order to create this, God had to have a starting place that was outside of creation. And that's what we're going to investigate today, and that's what we're going to see is that God did exist before creation. And we're going to talk about where was he existing and, and where did he come from. Turn over to, to Psalms 93. Some things about the Lord here. Uh, actually, let's just, um, yeah, well, Gen Genesis chapter 21. Let's, since we're in Genesis, go to Genesis chapter 21 for a second. Verse 33. <clears throat> Abraham, when talking about the Lord here in Genesis 21, 33, and he says, and Abraham <coughs> planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. There we see a name for God. He's the, the everlasting. Now, what's that mean? Everlasting. That means forever, without beginning, without end. God is everlasting. And what we're going to see, he's going to be outside of time. He has no beginning and no end. He's everlasting. Turn over to Psalms 93. Psalms 93. Psalms 93, verse 2. Talking about the Lord. Oh, we start in verse 1. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Whereupon he girdeth himself, the world also established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting. The Lord comes from everlasting. When he embarks on this creation, and when he embarks in Genesis 1 1, we see him and God created. That God that's going to start creating is a God that comes from everlasting, meaning he has no beginning and no end. He comes from a place that is just forever. Now, there is a verse that actually tells us where God does live and come from. Uh, turn over to, um, well, before we go, let's see. Yeah, drop back to Psalms 90, verse 2. Before we, we get that, Psalms 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world. This, is, this, this verse 2 is going to take us before creation. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God is from everlasting to everlasting. From the distant past to the distant future, he is everything. He is from a place that, that encompasses everything. He's, he's eternal. Turn over to uh, Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. This verse in Isaiah 57 we're going to go over is the answer to where God comes from. See, people have, have a hard time, time understanding how God can be outside of time. They have a hard time understanding how you know, time moves and they believe you know, God is moving with time and they don't really understand how this all works. Well, in the passage in Isaiah 57 here is the answer. Isaiah 57 verse 15. This is going to tell us where God is from. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth, where? Eternity. Where does God inhabit? Eternity. God is from eternity. You want to know where God lives? In eternity. There is a place called eternity that God inhabits. This Eternity is outside of creation. This eternity is where God lives in, in eternity. He inhabits this place of eternity. And that place of eternity is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, we have a hard time understanding eternity. Uh, in fact, we... The, the, the best way to, to describe it is just we use the symbol that goes like this. 
probably have all seen that symbol in your math classes. That means infinity. Meaning it has no beginning, no end. It just constantly is in a state of constant. And, and that's where God is from. He's, he's from a place called eternity. And I, what I want to do today is just for a few minutes is talk about eternity. You see, eternity existed before creation. This is where God, God was. This is what, it, it's different than creation. It's not the same thing. It operates different than creation does. We're going to see when God created, he created a, a place and a bunch of rules and laws that govern this creation. We all know what some of the laws are out there of creation. You have the, the law of thermodynamics. You have the, the law of, well, I can't remember another one, right? <laughs> There's, skip in my mind, but there are laws, out, law of gravity. There are laws out there that God has written that operate within the sphere of creation, but that do not operate in eternity. We're going to see how time, God created time in eternity. But outside of eternity, there is no eternity. There is no time. You see, God is, God is greater than the creation. Let's turn over to um, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 for a second. 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8, verse 27. See, when, when God created, he created creation within eternity. Okay? God's from eternity, and what he did is when he makes creation, he makes it within the bounds of eternity, but we're going to see how he created it, so how a creation with time and matter and everything can exist in an eternal, where God is from. It's going to be quite interesting when we get to how he created it and how those two things can exist together. But creation is here. God lives outside of it. And in 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, verse 27, he tells us, um, Behold, um, but we, okay, it's verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven... And heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. In 1 Kings, it tells us that the heaven and heaven of heavens, and not even the earth, can contain God. That means God is bigger than what? Creation. That means creation, the, the writer here in 1 Kings is telling us that creation can't contain God because God is bigger. He fills more than the creation. He's everywhere. Turn over to um, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. Do us also with all that they're in. God, all this is his. And this is, we're going to, when we get through when we get into how God created everything, you see here, when we saw in 1 Kings, how he talks about the heaven and heaven of heavens. That means everything we know about creation, from the first heaven to the second heaven to the third heaven, God is greater than all that. You see that? How God exists, he's, he's, he's not within creation. See, I was telling you, I was in a philosophy class, and we were taught that God exists within creation. And that God's doing his best to try and fix everything. We'll talk more about that later when we talk a little bit about why there's death in creation. And what God's answer is to that. But there's a lot of philosophy out there that believes that God is limited. He is a creature within, trapped within creation. And we've just seen some passages that talk about the Lord, how it can't even hold him. It's because God is from eternity. Turn over to Psalms chapter 113. Yeah, not one. Psalms 113. Psalms 113, verse 4. We've just seen some passages how God, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Outside of this creation, there are some things that exist. In verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the what? Above the heavens. Outside of the heavens, God's glory 
shines. You see that? His glory shines above the heavens. There's things that happen outside of creation that are true. About, and that's where God is. You know how his glory can shine in eternity? Because that's where God is. And out there in eternity, his glory is just shining brightly. So bright we can't even see it. Because we're trapped within creation. We're going to talk about that as we get to there, how God fabricated this thing. But God inhabits eternity. So talking about eternity, um, I want to talk for a couple of seconds about time and how time works in eternity and, and how time works in creation. See, people have a hard time understanding how can God exist from everlasting to everlasting? How can he just be? And <coughs> we're going to do our best to explain a little bit. And it is a hard concept, and sometimes you just have to take the, the scriptures for what they are, that God just is. But in eternity, we're going to see there is no time. Time cannot exist in eternity. And you think about it this way. We think of time in a, in a linear fashion. Okay, we, we put our line, timelines are always like this, and we, we start here, and then 10 minutes later, we, we end up over there, and then 10 minutes later, we're over there. You see how we move down time. Now, if God is from everlasting past, that means to get, if this is the present, to get to the present, you have to have moved through this much time to get to that point. But if there's always more time in the past, You'll never get to the present because there's always a further back you can go. Does that make any sense to you guys or no? Okay. What I'm trying to describe here is that time cannot exist in eternity <laughs> because you'll never make it to the present because there's always further back you can go back. I don't know. That's sort of weird, but maybe you're, you're, you're getting it or not. But the point is time cannot exist in eternity. And so how does God exist? How does he exist in a timeless, see, eternity there is no time. How does he exist there? And, and the, the answer is actually found with how he, he presents himself. Go to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Exodus 3, verse 14. So if there's no time in eternity, because you would never make it to the present because you'd always be, be drawing backwards into everlasting, how does, how does he exist in eternity outside of time? Well, he tells us in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when he's talking to Moses and Moses says, what is your name? God answers um, with who he is. Um, verse 13, and Moses said unto God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. God says he is I am. What does that mean? That means God is. Eternity is an ever present. It just is. I am. Now, this may be hard to understand, but I'm trying to get a point to you. When you talk about God, He just is. He has no past, He has no future. He is. Eternity is. You know, I've been looking around, and there's a lot of discussion on what eternity is. And a lot of people wrestle with how eternity can exist. But that's the answer. It just is. It's an ever-present. God says, I am. And we're going to see what he does with time when he created it and how he can view it differently. But according to God, he just is. You see, that's how you can be from everlasting to everlasting. He ever lasts as is. See, God, God is life. He is life. He wasn't created. He didn't have a start to life. He just is. He never came into being. He always is. And, and we're going to see in a couple of seconds how that can help with how we go through time and how 
God can adjust with prayer and, and some things like that. But he, he's everything all at once. Turn over to Isaiah 48. Interesting passage here in Isaiah 48, verse 16. See, we view time as past, present, and future. Okay? To God, all time is. It just is. There is no past, present, and future when God views time from eternity. In Isaiah 48, verse 17, Thus saith the Lord, um, where was I? Oh, verse 16. Come ye near unto me, Hear this, it's the Lord spoken, uh, spoken, speaking. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. Now that's an interesting way he puts it. From the time of the beginning, he doesn't say, I was there. He says, there am I, presently. You see the difference in the wording there? Mm -hmm. Most people say, from the, yeah, at the beginning, I was there. God says, at the beginning, I am there. That is, this is like back to the past. And in the past, when we look at the past, God says, I'm there. You understand the difference? How it is because God inhabits eternity that God can look at any point in time as present. Because everything God looks at is present. It's, it's, and, and, you know, this may be esoterical. I don't even know what esoterical was, but above our heads. But that's what it is. It, he just is. And, and whether it's in past or future, it always is. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. We're going to see why this is sort of important here in a, first, in a couple minutes because there's a lot of uh, doctrinal error that, that can creep up into people's lives about God when they don't understand how, how he can interact with time. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, God says, I am Alpha and Omega. That's the beginning and the end. The, oh, well, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. You have past, present, and future, and God says, I am those, presently. He is all of time wrapped up in one moment. He lives ever presently. Past, present, and future to him are all the same. There's nothing in the future he does not know because he is there. There's nothing in the past he does not know because he is there. He, this, is, this goes back to, you know how we said God has all knowledge of all things? This is how it can happen. Because he's always there at an instantaneous moment of everything happening. You see, when God created us, he created us with a sense of that in a, in a, on a smaller scale. And, and so we can maybe relate just a little bit. When we go through time, we go through it linear, linearly like this. We have a past, a future, and a present. But let me ask you, do you ever live in the future? No. Can we ever live in the past? No. Where do we always live? In the present. We can't move to the future and, and get ahead of time. I do a little bit of magic shows once in a while. It would be really cool if I could transport someone a year into the future and then bring them back. Or it would be, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, time travel movies. People can travel. We can't do that. We're, we are stuck in the present. That, that gives us a, a little bit of an inclination of how God is. He is always is. He's always in the present. But the problem with us, as we move through time... We, we are moving through time, and we go from one present to the next. We forget what happens yesterday. Okay, Our life uh, is moving through time this way, through a present, but as we move through time, we do develop a history, a past. A past that is sucking the life out of us. You guys understand that? 
This is one of the reasons why God cannot be moving through time on a linear scale with us. Now, this is an example. But as we move through time, we are losing life to time. Time is sucking life out of us. We know people that have lived through the present, and then they die. That's because time is a robber of life. You see that? God does not lose life, does he? He is life. He is all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful. He cannot be moving through time this way because time would be sucking life out of God. So therefore, he is outside of time, in eternity, living in a constant present of I am. God is not moving through time with us. He cannot be. Just because of the way time operates, how it, it, the past is sucking you, sucking the life out of you. And so, but that's, that's how we live, though. Because God created time for us and time for his creation. So... Talking about the Lord. He is from ever, everlasting to everlasting. He looks at the past as being there. You see, when, when, when God views time, he views it differently than us. As we said, there's an eternity, and there's a creation, and all of God's attributes, his glory, his majesty, his um, omniscience, all these things reign outside here in eternity. Everything reigns out there. He has all those things. And then he chooses to interact with creation wherever he wants. You see, we view time like this. Okay? Now, on a literal scale, and that's how God created us to move through time. Now imagine if God could take time, and he can, and instead of having it be literal, literal, not literal, it is literal, linear, imagine, or horizontal, if he took time and he viewed it like that, Marker's going out, but vertical. And he can, and, and so therefore everything becomes present to him. Okay, do you under, do you, are you starting? I know this might be a little out there, but I'm just trying to help us understand how God can interact with time. And now imagine if God can intersect time wherever he wants, and to him it's always present because it's always viewed like this. See, we think of time like this, that's because that's how God created us. But God's outside of creation. He can, you know, when you make something, when you decide to make something, you can hold it, and sometimes we turn it and twist it and look at it from different angles. That's what God can do with creation. You know, God's much larger. We, we, we think creation is this massive thing that, that nobody can, you know, how do you deal with it? Well, to God, it's nothing. He can take creation and turn it, Spin it, look at it from this angle, look at it from this angle. He can look at it from any angle he wants, and within creation is time, and God can change that, and he can look at it this way. Therefore, everything becomes present to him. Now, I know this is maybe, maybe different, but that's just how it is. Turn over to, to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Talking about time and the Lord. We, we know that the Lord in time, he can view it differently than us. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Wow. God can do whatever he wants with time. One day is as a thousand years to us, and a thousand years is as one day to the Lord. He can manipulate it. He can intersect it. He can do whatever he wants because it's his. It's his creation. And he can spin it and turn it and, and move it and intersect it anywhere he wants. Turn over to um, Psalms chapter 90, verse 4. Psalms 90, verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. A watch in the night is about a three-hour segment. You know, when, when, when the army was out on patrol, they would have 
you know, people do watches so that way the enemy wouldn't come and surprise them while they were sleeping and they would tell, you know, hey, Mr. Joe, it's your turn to do the watch and Mr. Mike, it's your turn after that and, you know, Mr. Frank, it's your turn after that. And they would give them like three-hour segments to do their, do their watches. And here it says, a watch in the night is, is a thousand years to the Lord. Time, he can do whatever he wants with it. It's immaterial to him. He can, he can intersect it whenever he wants. And to him, it's always present. But he doesn't have a problem with time. He, he can do whatever he wants with it. Um, uh, you see, this is how God can know what's going to happen in the future, as if he's there. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. And him, being delivered by determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. The foreknowledge of God. What does foreknowledge mean? Foreknowledge means knowing things before they happen. That's it. That's an easy definition. The foreknowledge of God. God knows what's going to happen before it happens. You know why? Because he's been there already. He's seen it. And when God saw how they were going to crucify Jesus Christ on the cross, he didn't have to make that happen. He didn't have to, 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 to cause those Roman guards to do that because he wanted the be fulfilled. God knew that was going to happen because he witnessed it. See, there's a difference between foreknowledge and predestination. Predestination is when you make something happen in the future. Foreknowledge is when you just know something's going to happen in the future. Okay, let's say there's a, a Chicago Bears are going to play later today. If you could travel in the future and watch the game and know the score and then come back and tell me the score right now, that would be foreknowledge. That would mean you witnessed it happen, you saw it happen. But you didn't have any interference with making it happen. Big difference. Predestination is you're able to go out there and manipulate the game to cause a certain outcome. But for, God works with foreknowledge. You know how he knew Jesus Christ was going to be crucified on the cross and by wicked hands slain? Because he saw it happen as it happened. And then he has Isaiah and those men write it down. That's what real prophecy is. Prophecy is just God knowing what's going to happen. It's like, how do you think God knew Joseph and Mary were going to get married and uh, meet each other? Because God saw it happen. And then God chose them to have his child through. God didn't have to make them come together. Because God knew that they were going to because he was there. He witnessed it. You have to understand. I mean, you don't have to understand this, but it's good to understand this because it will help you understand how God deals with creation. He doesn't have to make everything happen. He just sees it happen. Turn over to um, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. If I can get there. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. See, there's a foreknowledge of God there that Peter talks about. See, God knows there's going to be a group of people called the elect. He didn't have to choose those people to be called to, to be the elect. He just knew that they were going to do that by his foreknowledge because he's there in the future watching it happen. See, people get all, all out of sorts with thinking that God's predetermining one person to get saved and he's damning another. He's predestined your life. No. God hasn't predestined your life whether you're going to get saved or not. He can witness it, in, and when he witnesses, he's witnessing it in real time. But he's not making and causing someone to get saved and causing someone to get lost. Just because he knows it doesn't mean he caused it. There's a foreknowledge of God that he talks about. Go back to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, verse 18. Known 
unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. God knows everything. You know how he can know everything? Because he witnesses everything in real time, as I am. Now that's hard for us to maybe comprehend, but it is how it works. That's why he's God and you're not. <laughs> you can't do the things God can do. And anytime you think you're smarter than God, you just try and remember some of this stuff, and you can't do it. Don't tell me you're going to go against the Lord when you can't even manipulate time like he manipulates it. Go to Isaiah 46, verse 10. Isaiah 46, 10. Verse 9. This is why he could write some stuff like this. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Do you know there is not another person that can manipulate time like he can? You know Satan can't? Satan is a creature locked in time. Satan can't move through time like God can. I mean, this is fascinating when you think about what God can do with time. There is none else like him. Verse 10, what are some of the things that only God can do? Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet, what? Done. See, God can declare the end. Things that we don't know, but he can declare it. You know why? Because he is there right now. And he can speak what's going to happen. Isn't that, I, I find that quite interesting and quite fascinating. You see, there's a, there's a problem. This is a problem that, pe that people wrestle with. Uh, Christians. Why pray? If everything's predetermined and everything's going to take place no matter what, why are you praying? Well, the point is, is that just because we've talked about some of the answers, just because God knows the future doesn't mean he makes it happen. And with God, as we move through time, he is ever-present. So we are to pray, because we don't know what the future is. And we are to ask God's help and hand in our lives. And God can do that because everything, <coughs> everything with God is now. Is now. So that's why he asks us to pray. We don't know what's going to happen. Our, 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 we don't know the future. He does. But as he goes, as we go through time, he is always presently there. So he asks us to pray. And ask his hand for help. And ask his hand for things that, that we need. <laughs> and, that, and that's why he tells us, what does, he tell, what does Paul tell us? To be in constant prayer. Pray without ceasing. See, some people say, well, why should I pray if it's already predetermined and I'm not going to be able to change anything? That's not true. As God, as we move through time, God is there ever present with us. He's not, just be, he's not going to um, make the future happen in a certain way because it has to happen that way. No, God has seen what's going to happen, but as he goes through time with us, it's ever-present, and therefore he asks us to pray, because we pray in the present with God. So don't think prayer is futile, because then you're going to end up being futile. What's the point of living if everything's set and determined and why? You know, no, that's not true. God did institute a thing called free will into this creation. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to Adam, and how how free works with this, but free will can work with this. Free will and foreknowledge can go hand in hand. They can. Because foreknowledge doesn't create the future. Just because God knew those Roman guards were going to crucify Jesus Christ doesn't mean he made them do that. He just saw it happen. Then he had Isaiah write it down. That's how it works. We don't have to get all discompobulated about these things. To, an example of this is in uh, Isaiah chapter 44. Since we're in Isaiah, go to, go to 44. There is a man who came to great prominence in, in Persia. And um, he became king. His name was Cyrus. Okay? Cyrus. And 
Isaiah was written many, many years before Cyrus ever was born. Okay? You see, Cyrus appears much later after Isaiah has been dead. Well, when Cyrus came to power, he went and he heard something, and he went and he found, he wanted to find, because he heard that his name was maybe written somewhere before he was born. And he goes and he searched, and he heard this rumor, and he went and he searched, and he found this book of Isaiah, a scroll written of the Jews, that was tucked away, and, and uh, I'm not going to say it was dusk. I don't know how he found it, but all I know is he found it. And it was written hundreds of years before he was born. And here he reads in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, that says Cyrus. This is the Lord having Isaiah write about Cyrus way before he was born. That saith of Cyrus. He's going to say some things about a man named Cyrus. He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have beholden, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of king to open before him the two left gates, and the gate shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break down and break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden treasures of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by name, am the God of Israel. Now imagine if you're Cyrus. <laughs> and these things have started to happen in your life. And then you find this scroll of Isaiah and you read that. Wouldn't you be sort of moved? And he was. Cyrus was a, a great man for God, and he helped reestablish the nation of Israel after some of the terrible things excuse me, they went through. And the reason God can write this is because God was there the day Cyrus was born, and God can see what Cyrus is going to be doing and the heart that Cyrus is going to have. He didn't have to make it happen. God can write about it before it happened. I think that's fascinating. How God, and the way God can do that is because he can manipulate time any way he wants. Past, present, future. He can intersect time wherever he wants. And time has no bearing on God. You ever wonder how if there's a 10 million Christians in the world, I don't know what the number is, Maybe more than that, maybe less than that, I don't know. If everybody prays to God at the same time, how can he give everybody individual attention? But he can. Because time is irrelevant with God. And when you pray to God, he can give you all the time you need on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Because he can manipulate time. Slow it down, speed it up. Slow it way down. Whatever amount of time you need when you pray with him, he's there for you. You don't have to worry that you have a very short time with God. You know, when you, if you want to go see someone important like the president, he's got a schedule, and you might get five minutes with him, and that's all you're going to get. No, with God, you can have all day. In fact, he wants all day. He tells you to pray without ceasing. He's made all the time available for you and for me. And the, way, and the reason he can do that is because he is from eternity. He's still there. God's still in eternity. Creation is within eternity. It's wrapped around. Eternity wraps around creation. And we're going to see that as we get into the next couple weeks now when we start to see how God creates and how he can make a creation that can live within eternity. You see, in eternity, there is no space. Turn over to a um, couple, couple last points on, on uh, eternity here. Uh, Psalms 89, yeah, Psalms 89, verse 12. Interesting note. See, everything we think is, is, happens like in the material world, and we think everything exists like that. In eternity, there's no time, there's no space. Turn over to, uh, where were we? Uh, Psalms 89, verse 12. The north 
in the south, thou hast created them. Well, what's that just tell you? In eternity, there's no north and no south. What's that? There's no, there's no space. It can't exist in eternity. Because if it did, north would always be more north. <laughs> You'd never reach the end. South would, you see, in eternity, what you find, eternity is the fullness of everything. It lacks nothing. We've read about the fullness of God, how he lacks nothing. Eternity isn't nothing. It's not blank. Eternity is the fullness of everything. So eternity is the fullness of God. It's everything. It's not nothing. It's everything that God is. Eternity is just God. It's the fullness of him. It's, it's everything. So we've, we've seen how there's eternity, and there's creation inside of eternity, and how time operates within his creation, how it works there. And there are two separate things. Now, there's one more thing I want to go over here in, in Ephesians chapter 2. You know, there's, there's a, a concept here that some Christians throw about a little bit, you know, and when we die, we're going to go into eternity. Well, that's really not true. Um, we will never be in eternity. Uh, we can't be there. We are not timeless beings that have always existed. Because that's the only type of, 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 of person, only God can exist in eternity. We all had a start time. We all had a point where we began. Just like time. Time had a point of beginning. And uh, we can't exist in eternity. But God made creation so that um, we can exist forever, though, within creation. And forever going, forever down the timeline now, we can. And so sometimes we say, oh, we're going to be in eternity. Well, that's really not true. We're going to be forever within this creation. We're going to see in a little bit in the next lesson or two how God formed it and how he created it and how that can work. But um, there's the question, that's right, does time exist after we die? You know, when we finally reach, when we die and we get to heaven and everything, will there be time in heaven? Well, yes, there will be. Because, like I said, we're not going to exist in eternity. We're going to be eternal beings. We will live forever. But within the creation that God has created. Uh, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. And we'll just start up in, in verse 6, where he's talking about us and, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Isn't it fascinating in that verse 6? He made us sit together. Christ views us the moment you say, He views you as sitting with Him. As being right there, right then. I mean, that's how God views time. We're there with him right now. Oh, that's going to be, that's, that's fascinating. But it, verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. In the ages to come. See that in verse 7? That's after we've made it to heaven. That's after we're sitting there. God has designed ages to come. Ages. Are coming. That's time, time based. That means after, when, when God gets done with one section of what He wants to do with us, there's going to be another section. And whether it's 10,000 years or 100,000 year sections or however God designs it, there's more coming. Time will exist in heaven. The ages to come, one after the next, after the, forever. That's really, that's nice. God's got it all planned. And to God, it's all happening right now. That's, that's wonderful. And look what he says he's going to be doing in those ages. Verse 7, That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness. For all of eternity, God's going to be showing his grace and his kindness to us. Age after age. As God has planned these things out, it is God's purpose and intent to show you his kindness. Isn't it? That's wonderful. God's going to, his grace and his kindness, he just wants to share with us. That's why he gave us his word. See, God's all about being kind to his creation. When we see creation, God, God creates it in the last few lessons, we're going to see God was kind. He created a perfect environment for his creation to live in. He created an environment where, where we can <coughs> live and breathe and, 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 and enjoy all the good things of God. Until man chose sin, and we'll deal with some of that. But once God's done dealing with sin, and, and we get out into these ages, there's nothing left.
but his kindness and his grace to be shown to all of us. Don't ever worry about eternity. It's going to be wonderful. Don't ever worry about living forever out here in these ages within this creation of his. It's going to be wonderful for us. God has planned it all out, and um, it's something special. And his word is written to help us understand those things. And his word is written to, to help us have a, a, an appreciation with our God. And uh, God's kindness is shown throughout all of Scripture. So when we get back to, to time and eternity, we've, we've learned that God inhabits eternity. That's where he lives. Eternity is him. It's an ever-present state. We've seen how God has created time and God can manipulate and view time differently. And we've seen how, how that can work in our lives. And we see how that we have a beginning, just like time does. But we will live forever inside this creation. Because God has planned <coughs> excuse me, age after age after age for us to have a relationship with him. What a wonderful thing. So I hope that helps in our understanding of God and, and how he can interact with creation and where he's from and how he is outside of creation. He's not a part of it. He is outside of it. And, and he created all things. And the things he created still can't contain him. So anyway, next week, uh, the next lesson, we're going to get into how he did this and what he did this and, and how he can make creation and eternity sort of coexist together. It's going to be pretty neat, so we'll see you then. Thanks.